Hi, can you guys all see me and hear me okay? Awesome, thank you. Okay, so today we're gonna jump right into chapter eight because we need to finish up chapter eight today. To make sure that you guys are well prepared for the quiz that is on Monday in class. And just uh, two more reminders noted here that you guys do have an achieve homework that's due on Monday morning, as well as the chart upload that we've been talking about that's for extra credit. Um, Any time before the end of the day on Monday is valid for uploading that chart for full extra credit points on that chart. Um, keep in mind, you cannot, you cannot use your chart during the quiz. So this chart is intended to prep you for the quiz as a study tool, but it is not part of the quiz and you will not have access to it during the quiz. Um, or if you do, it would be an honor code violation. So please make sure that you're leaving your charts in a drawer or hidden away so that they're not um, within reach. All right, so today, like I said, we're going to finish up chapter eight. We have a lot of ground to cover, but you guys will see that many of these uh, reactions have a similar theme going along with them. This last one on here is in blue because for whatever reason on the slides that I've posted previously for this chapter, uh, it was left off of my outline for the chapter. I'm not sure why that is, but it's back on now and we'll cover it at the last couple of slides of class. So without any further ado, I want to pick up where we left off on Wednesday with the cyclopropanation of alkenes using carbene electrophiles. So as I talked about on Wednesday, and as you guys know from your previous work in Chapter 4, carbenes have sort of dual reactivity to them, right? They have an electrophilic spot, which is this empty P orbital, and they have this nucleophilic spot, which is a lone pair that is residing in a hybridized sp2 orbital. And again, in a carbene, there are no formal charges on the carbon, but that carbon only has six electrons. So it is not fulfilling the octet rule, and that's part of what makes it a reactive intermediate. And again, it has both nucleophilic and electrophilic capabilities. Because we're in chapter eight, talking about the reactions of alkenes, what we're gonna see is that in this case, our carbene is going to fit into our typical theme and trend here where our pi bond electrons will act as a nucleophile. That's been the overarching theme and trend of the whole chapter. The pi bond electrons of the alkene will act as a nucleophile. They will reach out to this electrophilic empty P orbital and create one of the two sigma bonds needed to make our three membered ring. As that is happening, the whichever carbon is not involved in making that new bond is going to have electron density pulled away from it. So it'll be building up a delta positive charge. And that makes it primed to be attacked by the nucleophilic lone pair on the carbene to create our second sigma bond that we need to make our cyclopropene ring. So this is happening all at the same time in a concerted fashion. The pi bond is acting as a nucleophile to reach into the carbene's electrophilic MTP orbital. And when that initiates, that also creates a situation where the nucleophilic lone pair on the carbene can reach out into the now electrophilic carbon at the other side of the double bond. And overall, what we get out of this is a cyclopropane ring. As I mentioned on Wednesday, this is the mechanism that you need to know for cyclopropanation. Right here is the mechanism that you need to know for cyclopropanation. But what we also need to know, because we can't just order up our favorite carbene from our favorite chemical manufacturer, we have to know the ways that we can generate carbenes out of molecules that look a little bit more normal. And so I told you on Wednesday that there are three different methods of creating carbenes, and I'm going to go through each of these in the next slides coming up. And you'll see basically that these are the reagents that you need to achieve something that looks like this so that you can achieve this type of reaction. So here is the first set of reagents. It's called diazomethane. And if you look at the Lewis structure for diazomethane, you'll see that it has indeed two resonance structures. And if you look closely at this resonance structure on the right here, you might be able to see that this looks like a molecule of nitrogen, like molecular nitrogen N2 that is in the air all around you. And it has a positive formal charge on it. So if we were to break this bond and give these electrons to that nitrogen, 
you would actually create exactly the same molecular nitrogen that is all around us right now. And you would leave behind a carbene. And indeed, that is exactly what happens if you take diazomethane and diazomethane, excuse me, and you subject it to heat or light, you break this nitrogen carbon bond, you give those electrons to the nitrogen, which leaves and actually like, you know, goes out of your reaction flask because it's a gas. And what you leave behind is carbene um, with its six electrons and its typical reactivity. So this carbene, this CH2 carbene, can be used to do cyclopropanation of alkenes. But the problem here is that in practice, diazomethane is not a very stable reagent. It is very toxic. It is highly explosive. And the other problem is that when you form free carbenes like this, just a carbene that's loose and running around in your flask, it can react with the alkene to make a cyclopropane, but it can also react in all sorts of other ways. And so you end up getting a lot of side reactions. So. Ideally, we want to find a different way than diazomethane, but this diazomethane reaction is the most traditional way. It's the most old-fashioned way to make carbenes, and it's the way that makes the most sense from a rational sort of arrow pushing an electron movement perspective. So I wanted to introduce you guys to this. To get around these problems, though, we can use more modern reagents, and those more modern reagents look like this. This is called a Simmons-Smith reaction, because we're gonna use this Simmons-Smith reagent. So when we take CH2I2 and mix it up with zinc and copper together, we get what's called a carbonoid, a Simmons-Smith reagent, which is a carbonoid. And I'm not gonna ask you guys to understand the structure of this or exactly the details of what's going on here. What I'm gonna ask you to know is that it behaves just like a carbene, all right? So this, reagent is effectively a carbene, but the carbene is stabilized by the zinc, by these iodines, and so it doesn't go off and do all sorts of crazy other reactivity. It's essentially a more mild reagent, and it does exactly and only the chemistry that we want, which is to insert into an alkene to give you a cyclopropene. So you may see this um, reaction listed as the two components, right? The CH2I2 with the zinc copper mix, or you may see it listed as this um, iodine CH2 zinc iodine, which is the actual Simmons Smith reagent that's made when you put these, these components together. Either one, if you see either one of these things over the arrow, that should be your signal that your alkene is going to become a cyclopropane where this CH2 will become the carbene that inserts into that alkene. This is the best method for preparing cyclopropanes. Hands down, it's a mild reagent. It doesn't have a lot of side reactivity. And if all you want to do is take your double bond and make it a three-membered carbon ring, this is the way to do it. There's one more method for carbene insertion to alkenes, and that is to generate a cyclopropane that has halogens on it. So the way that we do this is we take chloroform or bromoform, so that's CHCl3 or CHBr3, and we subject it to strong base conditions. So in the presence of a strong base, you can actually deprotonate this proton. Typically, you can't really deprotonate a CH bond, but because of all these electron withdrawing groups, it works in this situation. So we generate this carbon-based anion, and from this carbon-based anion, we can do what's called an alpha elimination reaction. So you don't have to worry about the words here, but from this carbon-based anion, what you can have happen is um, one of these carbon bromine, or in the case of chloroform, it would be a carbon chlorine bonds, can break with the electrons leaving to go with the halogen. So you're leaving with a bromide minus, and what that does is create um, the negative charge will go with the bromine minus. So what's being left behind is a neutral carbon-based species that has just six electrons around carbon and an empty P orbital. And this is now a carbene, right? It's a carbene that is substituted with two halogens, a dibromocarbene if we started out with a bromoform or a dichlorocarbene if we started out with chloroform. And so we can take this chloroform or bromoform 
and create this dihalocarbene. And this dihalocarbene can insert then into an alkene the exact same way a CH2 carbene would. So let's see this in action in some examples. If you have this um, sort of trans alkene with the phenyl groups on opposite sides of each other, um, and you treat it with chloroform under strongly basic conditions, that chloroform will result in generation of a dichlorocarbene, and that dichlorocarbene will insert into that alkene to generate this molecule. And of course, it will generate this molecule and the enantiomer of this molecule because the um, carbene can insert from either face of that double bond. In this case of the cis alkene down below, we have a similar example, except this time we're using bromoform in strongly basic conditions. So we would create the dibromocarbene and the dibromocarbene would insert into this alkene to make our new three-membered ring with two bromines at the new carbon position. So this bromocarbene, the dibromocarbene, can also add to the top face or the bottom face of this double bond, and indeed both happen in a statistically equal um, mixture. But it turns out in this case, you make the same product regardless of which side you add to the double bond because of the plane of symmetry internal um, with this molecule. Okay. So one thing to note here is that because we are doing the cyclopropanation in a concerted fashion where both of these two new sigma bonds are being made at the same time, whatever the stereochemistry was of that double bond, it will be retained in our cyclopropane. So if we started with two substituents that were trans to each other relative to this double bond, they will be trans to each other um, relative to the cyclopropane ring. Likewise, if there are two substituents that were cis to each other in reference to the double bond, they will still be cis to each other when you install that cyclopropane ring. And that's an important feature that follows directly from the mechanism. So again, this is a concerted mechanism. We're making both of these bonds at the same time. So the fact that this alkene cannot rotate uh, because it's an alkene and a pi bond that's what allows the stereochemistry of the alkene to translate over to the cyclopropane product. All right, so just another kind of uh, slide to summarize and drive this point home. If what you wanna do is make a cyclopropane ring with all carbons and hydrogens, you use a Simmons-Smith reaction, which looks like this. If what you wanna do instead is create a cyclopropane that has two halogens on it, then you would want to use an alpha elimination reaction using bromoform or chloroform and a strong base. And again, um, all of these kind of processes follow directly from the mechanism. I'm not going to ask you to come up with the names of these reagents on your own, uh, but what I might do is if I show you these reagents, I might ask you to tell me what the product would be or what type of a reaction this, these reagents would do. All right, so the next topic that we have is gonna be epoxidation of alkenes. And I recognize you guys don't know what an epoxide is yet, but you're about to find out. So here we go on the next topic. In an epoxidation reaction, what we're gonna do is convert our alkene double bond into what's called an epoxide. The word epoxide refers to a three-membered ring with an oxygen in as part of that ring. So it's a three-membered ring, two carbons, and one oxygen. And what we're doing in this case is we're using a reagent called a peroxy acid to do this chemistry. And I'll show you mechanistically how this works on the next slide. But what I want you to notice is this peroxy acid looks kind of like a carboxylic acid, but it has an extra oxygen stuck in the middle here of, um, of this kind of sigma bond chain. And overall in this reaction, that extra oxygen is the oxygen that ends up being part of your epoxide. So just to kind of draw that point out a little bit further, if I draw a carboxylic acid that you guys should know from your chapter two functional groups, if I draw that out directly below the peroxy acid, you can see that they are almost identical. They both have a carbonyl group, this carbon oxygen double bond, and they both have a single bond to oxygen and a single bond between oxygen and hydrogen, 
It's just that the peroxy acid has an extra oxygen atom inserted in this uh, location right here. The most common peroxy acid used in real life is called metachloroperoxybenzoic acid. It looks like this. Um, here's the chloro group. Benzoic acid is the name of the carboxylic acid derived from benzene. So here's the benzene ring. You guys won't need to know the structure. You don't need to know how to write out metachloroperoxybenzoic acid, but you do need to recognize this acronym. And so if you see MCPBA, over an arrow, that should be an indication to you that this is a peroxy acid, A P stands for per, peroxy benzoic acid, and it will effectively do an epoxidation like what you see here. It's not the only peroxy acid. In fact, you can use any peroxy acid and any R group out here, and we'll see examples of that coming up. So, here is mechanistically what's going on. And yes, you will need to know and understand how to do these mechanistic arrows. So in this peroxy acid, what you have here is the same theme as what we've already been talking about. You have some pi bond electrons that will act in a nucleophilic fashion to create one of the new sigma bonds that's needed for our epoxide ring. And that's going to kick off the sequence of electrons moving around within the reagent, within the peroxy acid reagent, and ultimately two electrons that come from the peroxy acid reagent will create our other sigma bond. So you can see this transition state here. We have a partially broken pi bond, two partially formed new sigma bonds that will create our epoxide two partially broken sigma bonds that will release that oxygen atom from the per acid, and two partially formed bonds here that account for those electrons moving around. We're going to form a new carbon-oxygen double bond up here, a new oxygen-hydrogen bond here, and then of course we're going to have to break this carbon-oxygen double bond to accommodate all of those electron uh, movements. So you can see that represented in these mechanistic arrows, which again, as a reminder, go from an area of high electron density to an area of low electron density. So it shows the pi electrons attacking that oxygen, these oxygen-oxygen sigma electrons becoming the pi bond electrons of this carbon-oxygen double bond in the product. This carbon-oxygen double bond uses its pi bond electrons to make a new sigma bond here. And this OH sigma bond uses these electrons to break this bond and make a new bond here, shown in the epoxide. Okay, so this is a concerted reaction. It happens in one step, and that means that it's happening only on, um, so the stereochemistry of the alkene follows through to the product. It's a concerted reaction. All of these bond making and breaking events happen in concert at the same time and that means that we can see the stereochemistry of the alkene displayed in the epoxide. It's preserved. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, here's a cis double bond. And when we react this cis double bond with a peroxid, a peroxy acid, such as MCPBA, we create this epoxide where the two methyl groups are still cis to each other with respect to this ring. If we had the trans geometric isomer here, and reacted it with MCPBA, we would still get an epoxide, and our two methyl groups would be trans to each other um, with respect to the ring, the same way that they were trans to each other with respect to that pi bond. And of course, always, always, our MCPBA or whatever our peroxy acid is, is creating an epoxide. It can add to both faces, and it does so 50% of the time from the top and 50% of the time from the bottom. So if we are creating a situation where we could create enantiomers, we create both enantiomers in a 50-50 racemic mix because we cannot create optical activity, right? So we've created chiral centers in this reaction, but we have to create 50% of one set of chiral centers and 50% of the enantiomer set of chiral centers. Okay, and again, um, we can see the stereochemical information translated from our alkene to our three-membered ring 
because of the concerted mechanism. And this is exactly the same, completely analogous to what happens in a cyclopropanation reaction. It also actually happens in the mercurinium ion formation and the bromonium ion formation. All of these times that we're making three-membered rings using concerted chemistry, we are always going to be able to track our geometry of our double bond to the geometry of the ring system. Okay, so uh, somebody's put a question in the chat box. It says, if we wanted to make only a specific enantiomer, would it be possible to then create optical activity or would we have to start with a completely different reagent? So in general, in chemistry, we cannot create optical activity. If we wanted to get exactly one enantiomer and only one enantiomer, we would have to include in our reaction what's called a chiral reagent. So if we used a version of a peroxy acid that had a chiral center on it, then we might be able to influence and preferentially only um, add to our double bond from one face or the other. Those are very difficult reactions to do. And you would have to have, at some point in your reaction, you would have to have an optically active reagent to be able to then instill that optical activity in your product. Um, but that's a great question. Okay, so just a reminder down here that it is really hard to just memorize all of these things. It's really hard to memorize all of these things um, and all of the stereochemical outcomes of all these different reactions if you don't understand them. But if you understand how it works, if you can rewrite the mechanism, then you can find your way to the stereochemistry without memorizing it. It follows naturally from the mechanism using the constraints that we already know, things like pi bonds can't rotate, right? If we can't rotate a pi bond and we do a concerted reaction on the pi bond, then the, the stereochemistry of the pi bond will translate forward. All right, there's another question in the chat box. When manufacturing only one enantiomer, do scientists usually isolate one enantiomer from the other after getting a racemic product, or would they just go through with the difficult reaction? So that depends on the situation, right? It depends on the situation entirely. The ideal situation is to have uh, what's called a chiral catalyst, where you have a small amount of some chiral reagent or optically active material that helps to create the right situation to create the right enantiomer of what you want, but you don't have to use a lot of it. So a perfect example of that is all of the enzymes that are doing chemistry in, in nature, they're chiral reagents. So an enzyme could take this alkene and make just one epoxide enantiomer because that enzyme is chiral itself. Sometimes that's not the most cost-effective way to do it. And so sometimes making both enantiomers and then figuring out a way to separate them, which often involves derivatizing them with something chiral and then separating them, sometimes that happens too. So it really just depends on the situation. But the ideal situation is trying to figure out the right reaction conditions to just make the one you want. These are good questions. Okay, I had to keep moving to make sure that we cover everything. Um, that's left in chapter eight. So what we're gonna do now is take the very same epoxide that we just formed, which could be our target product, right? We could want to make an epoxide and then we would be done and all set and that would be a useful thing. But it turns out that epoxides are also useful as intermediates, synthetic intermediates on the pathway to something else. And so that's what I'm gonna tell you about now is the formation of one, two diols from epoxides. And so what this looks like, and you might be able to tell this from this word, all, O-L is for alcohol. So diols means we're gonna be forming two alcohols. And this one, two diol means that our alcohols are gonna be next door to each other at the one and two position. So if we take our epoxide and we add a little bit of acid, because this is an acid catalyzed process, and we add some water, then we can open up this epoxide ring and use water as a nucleophile to form the anti-diol specifically. So what do I mean by that? Well, here's our epoxide. The first thing we're gonna do since this is acid catalyzed is protonate our epoxide. And when we do that, we'll activate it for um, 
nucleophilic attack. So if you imagine once we have this protonated, it's a really good leaving group actually. And so a water molecule can act as a nucleophile and um, effectively facilitate an SN2 substitution at one of the carbons of this three-membered ring. So I really hope this is feeling very familiar to you guys because this is kind of just like we what we did with halogen addition, right? We're going to make a three-membered ring and then we're going to use a nucleophile to open that three-membered ring. And indeed, that's what happens here. We're going to protonate our oxygen to make it a better leaving group. And then we're going to use a water molecule as a nucleophile to do an SN2 attack at this chiral center, at this carbon center. So because it is an SN2 attack, it has to come from the backside. And so that stereochemistry is what sets this as an anti-dial formation where one of our hydroxyl groups will be on one side of the ring, the other hydroxyl group will be on the other side of a ring. This doesn't have to be a ring. I'm showing you a ring because it's easier to see. But whichever, whether it's a ring or not, whatever happens, what you know is that what you end up with is your two hydroxyl groups anti to each other, right? Because this nucleophile has to attack at the back side of this epoxide. So let's see some examples of what this looks like um, with some actual molecules. So here's cyclopentene. If we subject cyclopentene to a peroxy acid, in this case, we're doing peroxybenzoic acid, but it can be any R group out here. This could be MCPBA or it could be anything. When we do this, it's a straightforward epoxidation reaction. So we turn our alkene into an epoxide. Look at that, it's a yield of 100%. There's not much else going on here. There's not much else that can be done. And so we get a great yield of our epoxide. Well, what happens if we do the same reaction in the presence of some acidic water? So same cyclopentene starting material. We switched up our peroxy acid, but it doesn't matter. We could have used peroxy benzoic acid here, just like we could have used peroxy acetic acid up here. We have our peroxy acid with our alkene to create this epoxide, but this epoxide intermediate is not isolated because we are doing this reaction in acidic water. And so that water will activate the epoxide for nucleophilic attack and then attack at the backside of one of these bonds to install a hydroxyl group, one going up and one going back because they have to be anti to each other based on the SN2 mechanism of that nucleophilic attack. And of course, we'll get um, the water adding to one side and the other side in an equivalent fashion. And so you'll get both of these um, enantiomers because nothing here is optically active. So when we create these um, chiral centers, we would have to create the enantiomer in a 50-50 mixture as well. This 75% yield refers to both enantiomers. Pretty cool, huh? So here's another example. Here you have a linear alkene in a trans configuration, right? Or an E bond. If we treat this with MCPBA and there's no water around, then we can isolate this epoxide where these alkyl groups are trans to each other. Um, in a pretty good yield, 90% yield of 50% of this, and of course, 50% of the enantiomer because we didn't create any optical activity. We just created chiral centers in equal amounts. But note that in both cases, the alkyl groups are on opposite sides of, ring, of the ring to each other because that's the stereochemistry we had set all the way back here with our double bond. If we do the same reaction and we have water present or a little bit of acidic water rather, we will go through the same epoxide intermediate, but we won't stop there. We will also have this epoxide opened up by our water nucleophile to give our new hydroxyl groups in one, two position and empty configuration with respect to each other. Okay, so these conditions that we've been talking about give us the anti-dihydroxylation products, but what if we as synthetic chemists really need the syn dihydroxylation products? What do we do? So typical and par for the course for chapter eight, we're just gonna introduce some new reagents, a whole new set of reagents that achieve the goal that we need to achieve synthetically. So we just learned that epoxide 
And then hydration after the epoxide can lead to one, two diol formation with anti stereochemistry. And now I'm going to show you what you, what you have to do if you want to get syn stereochemistry for your alkenes. So the goal, remember, is to convert an alkene into a syn 1,2 diol. And there, there are actually two different ways to do this, and we'll take a look at both of them, and we'll also talk about the pros and the cons of each. One is called osmium tetroxide, osmium O4, followed by hydrogen, hydrogen peroxide, and the other is potassium permanganate under basic conditions. And this has to be cold and dilute. I'll talk more about this um, on the slides coming up, but this is very important actually. It has to be, for this potassium permanganate conditions, it has to be cold and dilute. Okay, so this is the picture view of what we're talking about. We're gonna take our alkene, treat it with our dihydroxylation reagents, and we're gonna add in two hydroxyl groups on the carbons directly next to each other, and their, their stereochemistry with respect to each other will be syn. So we can do that either with this osmium tetroxide hydrogen peroxide set of reagents, or we can use potassium permanganate under cold dilute basic conditions. So let's see what this looks like. First, the osmium tetroxide. This osmium tetroxide reagent adds to the double bond in a concerted way. And this is important. So it's gonna follow along the same themes as what we've been talking about all along. Because this reaction is concerted, the osmium tetroxide is only going to add to one face of the double bond at a time. It'll add to both faces and different molecules, but both of the new sigma bonds are going to be made on the same face of the double bond. So let's see what that looks like. Here is osmium tetroxide. It's also called osmic acid. You don't need to worry about those names, though. So <clears throat> just par for the course, the same types of mechanistic chemistry we've been seeing all along today and really all along in this chapter. Our pi electrons can act as a nucleophile to reach out and make one of the new carbon oxygen sigma bonds that's needed. That's going to initiate electronic rearrangement in our reagent where we're going to move electrons around to be able to accommodate two electrons from our reagent reaching back over to the opposite carbon of that double bond and creating the other carbon oxygen double bond that we need. So these are the mechanistic arrows that are important to know. And this is the intermediate that we get. Now from here, remember I said it was a two-step process with hydrogen peroxide. Uh, there are other reagents that will do this last step also, but hydrogen peroxide is the easiest one to remember. From this osmate ester, um, which you don't need to remember the name of that either, but from this five-membered ring intermediate, we can treat this with hydrogen peroxide. And what that does is cleave these osmium oxygen bonds to give us our OH bonds, and it regenerates our osmium tetroxide. So that can actually be used again in a catalytic fashion where one molecule of osmium tetroxide can actually convert many molecules of your alkene, which is convenient. One thing to note, is that because this is a concerted mechanism, both of these carbon oxygen bonds are being formed at the same time from the same face of the double bond. And that's what gives you the syn stereochemistry of your um, diol in the end, all right? And of course, this is happening from both sides of the alkene. So we're gonna make enantiomers if we're generating chiral centers. All right, potassium permanganate looks a lot like osmium tetroxide from a mechanistic standpoint. And so we'll be able to kind of see this undergo very similar types of chemistry. So if you have a cold dilute solution of potassium permanganate, we're also going to go through a syn dihydroxylation mechanism. And this looks almost exactly the same. You have your pi electrons of your alkene creating one of your new bonds that causes electrons in your reagent to shift around and two electrons from your reagent will create that other new sigma bond. In this case, what we get to is gonna be called a manganate ester. Again, you don't need to worry about that name, but this is a similar analogous five-membered ring intermediate as we saw in the osmium tetroxide. So just for comparison, here's that osmium tetroxide mechanism in that first step again. And you can see how it's more or less parallel 
to the mechanism for permanganate addition to a double bond. In this case with permanganate, we treat under basic conditions to cleave off our manganate reagent and put on our two hydrogens that we need to get uh, to finalize our product. And we don't regenerate our reagent in this case. So we have to use enough potassium permanganate to match every molecule of substrate one to one. Okay, so a couple of things to note. This method, the potassium permanganate method, that's preferred because osmium tetroxide is expensive, toxic, and volatile. Lucky for us, in this class, we're only doing our chemistry on paper, so we don't have to worry about these things, which means that osmium tetroxide is totally a valid answer if what you want to do is sin dihydroxylation. In the lab, you would not want to choose it, but on paper, it works. And so it's an option for you to use. But potassium permanganate is the better choice. Um, there's a question in the chat box that says, is there an electron shift that happens first? Or are they all relatively concerted? They are all completely concerted. They are all completely concerted. It's happening kind of all at the same time. And it's easiest to think about the pi bond electrons kind of kicking this off um, and a, kicking the cascade of electron movement off because that's the way that makes it fit nicely conceptually into this chapter about alkene reactivity, where we've been talking at every step along the way about how the pi bond electrons are nucleophilic. But in reality, all of these electrons are moving all at the same time. And that's what gives us the um, stereochemical consequences that we see in the end product. Okay, so one thing to note about this potassium permanganate method, it is preferred because of all these terrible things about osmium tetroxide in real life, but it turns out that if you're not careful with your potassium permanganate reaction, if you let your solution warm up, or if you don't have it basic enough, more reactions can occur. You can get to your cis glycol or your cis 12 diol, and then you just keep on reacting. So, Keep in mind, if what your goal is, is to make a 1-2 syn dial and you want to use potassium permanganate, you need to commit to using these mild reagents, a cold dilute solution. I'm going to show you in this next section, oxidative cleavage of alkenes, what happens when you don't stick to those mild conditions. So here we go. We've been talking about 1-2 dihydroxylation in a syn fashion and how we can do that with potassium permanganate under cold and dilute conditions. And of course it goes through this five membered ring and that's the five membered ring that requires the syn stereochemistry or sets the, the syn stereochemistry of these two hydroxyl groups. So if you accidentally let your solution get too warm or too acidic or too concentrated, then what happens is that you actually cleave the carbon carbon bond that used to be your double bond. So that's not, like, that's not good, right? You just cleaved a bond that was part of your original, um, your original molecule. But what if you wanted to do that, right? So we can view this as a problem or we can pay attention to the outcome as chemists, see what the outcome is and see if we can make use of this and harness it as something that we can draw a function from. And so when you do this, when this reaction happens and you kind of over oxidize your diol, you get any carbon from your, um, from your double bond that was mono substituted. Well, actually, let me say di substituted first. If it was di substituted, so if both of these were carbon atoms, you would get a ketone. And if it's mono substituted, like you see here, you get an aldehyde at least at first, but then that aldehyde, because it's under strongly oxidizing condition, becomes a carboxylic acid. So let me show you what this looks like. Here we have a tri-substituted alkene, a generic tri-substituted alkene. And when we subject it to potassium permanganate conditions, first we're gonna make our syn 12 diol just the same way we did before going through that five-membered intermediate. But if we're under these harsh conditions of potassium permanganate, we get further reaction where we're gonna cleave this carbon-carbon bond and we're gonna oxidize each of these carbon-oxygen single bonds to become a carbon-oxygen double bonds. 
Now this aldehyde, which would have been pre, uh, created from the side of the double bond that had a mono substitution, it's not stable under these conditions because this CH bond is very susceptible to oxidation. And so it's gonna get oxidized further and an oxygen atom is gonna be inserted right in there to give a carboxylic acid. So the end result products of this pathway using this tri-substituted starting material are a ketone from the left half of the alkene and a carboxylic acid from the right half. So there, um, these are the intermediates that you go through. And that's important because we need to know as chemists that we could, if we wanted to, choose conditions that stop at this one, two dial. But the other thing to keep in mind is that the overall reaction here, if it helps you to kind of see what's happening, you can also imagine this reaction as we're taking our original alkene, we're slicing it right down the middle, and we're popping an oxygen on either side of that. So here's the left half of the alkene with an oxygen instead of a carbon double bond. Here's the right half of the alkene with an oxygen instead of a carbon double bond. And then we just need to remember any time, any time we have a CH bond, it's going to become oxidized to an OH bond. So here's some examples of this in action. If you have a double bond that looks like this, this is a tri-substituted double bond, just like what we were talking about. This tri-substituted double bond under harsh potassium permanganate conditions will become cleaved and will create a ketone from the side that was di-substituted and a carboxylic acid from the side that was mono-substituted. Now, what happens if you have a double bond that's not substituted at all. It's just a CH2 end of things. Well, that CH2 end would create essentially a, um, an intermediate that looks like this, right? Um, but that intermediate actually goes on to become carbon dioxide because we've said already that when you have these CH bonds, those are susceptible to further oxidation. So they will be further oxidized and it'll ultimately be processed to become carbon dioxide. So that's kind of a neat um, aspect here. If you pay attention to what we just did, we just took a double bond and created a ketone. We lost CO2 in the process, but that's fine. We, if, if that's what our goal is to create a ketone, we just figured out a way to do it. Likewise, you can take, if you have a double bond that's part of a ring and you cleave it, then you will open that ring. And you can see that with the other double bond example here where both of these ends are mono substituted. So both ends become a carboxylic acid. Okay, so we've been talking about potassium permanganate to do this oxidative cleavage. There is another set of reagents that can do this oxidative cleavage. And so I wanna introduce that to you guys now. This is called ozonolysis, where we are going to use ozone, like O3, like literally the same stuff that's in the ozone layer. We're gonna use that as a reagent to do oxidative cleavage of our alkene. Now, in this case, we get aldehydes and ketones, which is great because when we use potassium permanganate, we can't generate the aldehyde. Remember those aldehydes are unstable and they get further oxidized to carboxylic acids if we use potassium permanganate. So ozone is the reagent we have to use if what we wanna do is get an aldehyde. So here's the generic reaction. Here's our tri-substituted alkene. We do a two-step reaction where we subject it to ozone in the first step. And then the second step that is designed to help reduce the intermediate that's formed so that we get out our ketone. So that's the same as what you would get if potassium permanganate were used for the left half of the molecule. But this time for the right half of the molecule, we generate the aldehyde and we can stop here because the second set of reagents is um, considered to be a reducing environment. So I'm gonna show you guys the mechanism for this so that you can see it, but you do not need to know it, okay? But here's what it looks like. In the first step, we have O3, which is ozone, 
And this first step should look and feel exactly like the types of things that you've been seeing and, and kind of experiencing today anyways. The pi bond electrons are reaching out to make a new sigma bond. That's gonna help create a situation where electrons are moving around in the reagent and ultimately two electrons from the reagent reach out to the other carbon of the double bond and make another new sigma bond. We're gonna get a five membered intermediate. All of this happens in a concerted fashion. This five membered intermediate, here's where things get a little crazy, which is why you don't have to know and remember this mechanism, but I did wanna show it to you. This five membered intermediate can decompose into two pieces. And this decomposition is actually the step where we break that carbon-carbon bond that was part of our original alkene. After it decomposes into two pieces, those two pieces rearrange and combine in a different order. So this is just a rearrangement of this five-membered ring to get to this five-membered ring. And this is called an ozonide. It's the actual product of the first step of this reaction. This ozonide then, after you treat it with dimethyl sulfoxide or another uh, reducing reagent like zinc, that ozonide is cleaved under reductive conditions. And you don't have to worry about mechanistically how that works. Just know that this is cleaved to the point where you get a carbon oxygen double bond on both sides and you keep all of the rest of your original alkene intact. Right? So the left half of the alkene becomes a ketone because it was disubstituted. The right half looks identical to how it looked in the beginning, except it's a carbon oxygen double bond instead of a carbon carbon double bond. Okay, so here is a slide that's gonna kind of try to draw out this distinction between the two options for reagents to do this oxidative cleavage. If we have the harsh version of potassium permanganate, we are going to do our oxidative cleavage of our alkene. Of course, we will go through our syn dihydroxylation intermediate, but we won't stop there because these are harsh conditions. We will go to this oxidative cleavage intermediate where we have generated the aldehyde on the side that was monosubstituted and the ketone on the side that was disubstituted. But this aldehyde is not stable, so it goes on to become uh, further oxidized to the carboxylic acid. It's shown here as being deprotonated because we're under basic conditions, but this is indeed a carboxylic acid where this oxygen got inserted during the oxidation process. It wasn't part of your starting material. And you can contrast that with ozonolysis where you take your double bond alkene and you cleave it in the middle to generate these two carbonyls. And this time, because we're doing ozonolysis, which is a mildly, um, a mild, uh, reaction and we have a reductive step at the second step, we create our ketone on one side and our aldehyde on the other side. So you can see now why we had to learn both sets of reagents, even though they do very similar things. But depending on the situation you're in, the products are slightly different depending on if you have a mono substituted side of your double bond or not. And so you have to know both sets of reagents to be able to choose the right one for your chemistry that you um, have to do to get your target molecule. Okay, two more topics left. I know I only have a couple minutes, so I'm gonna make this quick. Section 8-16, which is about the polymerization of alkenes. You guys are not responsible for knowing this material. It's not gonna be tested during this semester at all, ever. Um, if you wanna read it for fun, go for it. It tells you about how PVC is made, how polystyrene is made, all sorts of cool materials that are part of our everyday lives. Olefin metathesis, I do wanna just kind of briefly introduce. I will not put this on Monday's quiz. I will post these slides and it will be covered for the exam. So let me introduce it briefly now. Olefin metathesis is not part of alkene addition, so it's not gonna end up on your chart but it's a reaction that's really important for modern organic chemistry. And it is a really useful reaction, but it's really weird. So here we go. What olefin metathesis does is that it takes two alkenes and it basically rearranges them and mixes and matches the two ends of the molecules. So if we have an alkene that looks like this and an alkene that looks like this, 
we can put them together with a catalyst and that catalyst will mix them up. It'll swap all of their ends and bits and pieces around so that it basically scrambles the um, alkene substituent pattern. So you can see we started out with an alkene that has A's on both sides and one that has B's on both sides. And what we end up with is one that has a B on one side and an A on the other side. So here's what this looks like with a real reaction. Here's propylene, which is the three-membered uh, carbon chain with a double bond in it. And you can put a couple, if you have two molecules of propylene, or obviously more than two, but if you have a catalyst, you can take the right-hand side of propylene and attach those two sides together. And you can take the left-hand side of propylene and attach those two sides together. So I'll talk briefly more about this after your quiz on Monday, because I'm out of time. But um, just to show you what these catalysts look like, they all have, um, these are, you'll, you will not need to know these catalysts and you will not need to know the mechanism for how this works. What you do need to know is the end result of this kind of like swapping and rearranging of the sides of the double bonds. But notice that in both of these catalysts, we have a metal to carbon double bond. And that's going to be kind of the key feature that makes this stuff work. So I'm out of time. I will post the last couple of slides on olefin metathesis so you guys can see it. And we'll talk about that on Monday. But again, I will not put olefin metathesis on the quiz on Monday because I didn't finish it. But everything else in Chapter 8, besides olefin metathesis and also besides you know polymerization, uh, as I've mentioned here, everything else in Chapter 8 is fair game for Monday's quiz. I hope you guys have a nice weekend and enjoy the nice weather song. And I can stick around for just a couple of minutes for questions if you guys have them. Um, hello, Professor. I actually have a question. It's not related to the chapter, but um, I was actually re trying to register for Argo 2 next semester. And I saw like, the seats are full. So is there any possibilities that later in the summer you will have more available seats or anything? Um, yeah, so a couple of things to note about this and several of you guys might have this question. So hopefully other folks are still around. Um, first of all, I don't have any control over registration. So I myself don't have control over the class size. I don't have control over overrides or anything like that. But what I can tell you guys is that um, typically what they do is that they don't release all the seats until right before the semester starts. Um, so keep an eye on it because if people are changing their schedule around, sometimes a seat or two might open up here and there, and then you can jump in. But they do typically reserve some seats and release them as the semester gets closer. Um, so just keep an eye on them and also ask your advisor because sometimes the advisors get a heads up about when that's going to happen. And so if your advisor knows that you're trying to get into a particular section, they might be able to give you a heads up about when to be paying attention more closely than other times. Um, so yeah, the, the answer is kind of a yes, there are going to be more seats, but I don't know how many, I don't know when they'll be opened up. Um, and you know, I've had a lot of people ask me, so even those that are opened up might not stick around very long. Um, and Audrey and everybody else, I will release the quiz five grades like within the next three hours. And if I don't, you can email me and, and bug me about it. Um, I meant to do it this morning and I've just been so busy keeping up with emails and, and other things. So I will release them, I swear. Um, you guys Thank you so much. Pretty well. Was there another question? Um, no, I just said thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Is it Sadia? Am I pronouncing that right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you're welcome, Sadia. Thank you. Bye. Bye.